Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is the Gospel lesson, Luke chapter 11. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you, and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God keep it. This is our text. Just how great is the malice of Satan and the grace of Jesus Christ? Our Gospel from Luke gives a very clear picture of both. A man is afflicted by a demon. He is unable to speak, and out of sheer grace, Jesus sends the demon away. The demon is exercised and gone. This man's house, that is, his body and his soul, are swept and put in order. And this man, of course, is grateful and praises God. Joy, sadly, is not the only reaction to this miracle. There is marvel, there is wonder, there is awe, and that's when the mind can't settle on faith. So the testing and the questions begin. One group there that day accused Jesus of working with Beelzebul. This is another name given to the devil himself. The confession of Beelzebul was Prince Baal, the false god of fertility that the nation of Israel itself had worshipped in its own history when it rejected the one true God. This was also the name of the false god of the Philistines that literally means the king of of flies or the great bumblebee. The Lord does this gracious miracle of relieving this man from a demon, and some accuse Jesus of working in league with gods who are only interested in orgy parties or being terribly bothersome like the bees and horseflies that swarm around us all summer. But that's not the only reaction either. Some just cannot fathom this great work. So they demand more. They want a sure sign from heaven, even though they just received one. They just had a sign, but it wasn't enough. They wanted just one more sign. Now here we see the pernicious, destructive, penetrating, and saturating work of Satan. Even on the gracious, merciful works of God, the devil is so wanton on destruction that he will drive mankind to doubt the gracious work of God. The devil does not simply have to possess man. He has greater works that prevail in more systemic evil. He tempts man. He uses our sinful nature to draw one of two conclusions. Either the
the works of God are just a show and Jesus is working under false pretenses. Or we just want to see one more work and then we will believe. In our text, Jesus addresses the first challenge, whether his ability to cast out demons is from God or from Beelzebub. He does address the second challenge concerning the sign from heaven in the verses that follow our text. And there he says, the only sign that will be given is the sign of Jonah. That is, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, he will be in the earth for three days and then resurrected. Our text today, though, concerns the first challenge. For whom does Jesus work? Jesus reminds us that there is a battle. This battle language should immediately bring us back to the tempting of Jesus in the wilderness. In that battle, Jesus used the clear authority of God's Word to drive away the attacks of the evil one. It's no big surprise that here he says the same thing. There are only two sides, God's or not God's. Either you are with God or you are against God. Satan seeks to scatter the church of God, to drive them against each other and to split them apart. Satan wants God's people to see the hypocrisy. He wants us to stay so focused on our sins, on our own way of doing things, that we turn ourselves into God's. The devil enjoys this so much that he entices us to believe that we can actually grow out of God. But Jesus works for the opposite. Jesus works to gather and unite, not with our own thoughts or our own feelings. Jesus unites us under His Word. We are fallen and broken, and He lifts and restores. A kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided house falls. Now for the early church, the clarity of this text would be hard to miss. There were no church buildings for Christians, they met in houses. In these house churches, they would hear these words read again and again. A divided household falls. There is no neutrality toward Jesus. There is no crossroads of decision making for you to decide what team you are on. Either you are with God or you are not. In the same way, there is no neutrality in worship. The true object of worship, of course, is God. And the false object is Satan, although it can take on many forms, such as worship of the world, worship of ideals, worship of feelings, worship of self, worship of nation, and many more. The house of worship that claims to honor God, but has no room for Christ, is in fact a synagogue of Satan. Jesus is to be the center of the church's worship. It is Christ and Him crucified that we are to preach, hear, pray, and receive. To not be about Christ is to be against Him. There's a beautiful illustration in this text. Now Satan is heavily involved. The devil, the world, and our sinful flesh are all axis powers against God. They work in league with each other to keep us away from God. Now I know that may sound strange, but hear these words again. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. The wilderness is no place to find rest, either for man or for spirits. The man who is baptized, whose faith has been exercised. Read through the baptismal rite again sometime. There are very clear questions. Do you renounce the devil, his works, his 
ways. And here, we use Luther's rite that begins with an exorcism. Depart, you unclean spirit, and make room for the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the blessed waters of baptism, the triune God enters the individual being baptized. The unclean spirit is driven away, and the house is swept and put in order. And what happens to the unclean spirit? It passes through waterless places. It wanders through the wilderness, seeking a place to rest. And when it finds none, we see the evil of Satan and the evil angels. It returns to the place that it left. And when it returns, it finds one of two things. Either the strong man is there guarding the house, or it's empty. And if it's empty, it invites its friends over for a party, and the place gets destroyed. Now physically, we see just how true this is, don't we? When a sick man recovers, let's say, from gout or fever or whatever, and does not maintain a good diet in moderation after the illness, he falls back into that illness, and many times it is worse than it was before. Spiritually, we know what that looks like, and we know what that feels like. For example, we have, for an example, a great example, we have to look no farther, actually, than Saul and David in 1 Samuel 16. Saul was God's anointed, and when he rejected God's word, God anointed a new king. When David was anointed, God's spirit left Saul and rested on David. What happened to Saul? He rejected God's word. He refused to hold God's word sacred, and so the unclean spirit came back, and the strong man gone. Saul was plagued with restlessness, and he wanted music to uplift his soul. And where was he led? Of course, to David, who had God's spirit. When David played for Saul, Saul was refreshed and revived. So where do we go for refreshment? True and honest refreshment. Ephesians 9, or 5, verse 19, says it in very clear words. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Now, a woman is so overjoyed by these words of Jesus that she simply shouts out, Blessed is your mother! Oh, she must be so proud of you! And Jesus answers her how. He does not look as men look. He is not concerned with lofty words, fancy clothes, or the latest fashion trends in hair or beauty. He is concerned only with faith. He responds by saying, My mother is blessed, but not because she is my mother. The ones who are blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Hear and keep. Both of these words are present tense active participles, okay? So why is that important? It conveys a continual, ongoing hearing and keeping. The word used for keeping has some great nuances throughout the scriptures. The word literally means carrying out sentinel functions, to protect by taking careful measures to keep a law, a commandment from being broken. Jesus gives the picture of a Christian. The baptized take careful measures to remain ever vigilant in this daily battle against sin. The victory has already been won. Jesus, the stronger man, has died the perfect sinless death. He rose from the grave for the life of his saints. He, in baptism, drives away the unclean spirits from his children. And like a sentinel on the wall, he stands ever ready at guard. As it is wonderfully captured in Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. 
The unclean spirits will come back when they don't find rest. The battle is a daily one, but you, children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, you have no need for fear. The victory is won. The stronger man has swept your house and put it in order. Hear his word proclaimed. Gather at his holy table where he gives you the spoils of victory. He invites you to his house where he is front and center. He stands guard and he feeds you for the battle. He arms you. He feeds you. Like a sentinel at the gate, he stands here to guard, to keep the holy things holy and the evil out. And you are invited to this table to receive forgiveness of all your sins. You are welcome in this house where we address each other with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This place is centered in Christ and Him crucified. Each week, we are given another sign from heaven. This is my body. This is my blood. It is in this house that we gather together for only one purpose, to be filled with the good things of God Himself. Lord, be our light when worldly darkness veils us. Lord, be our shield when earthly armor fails us. And in the day when hell itself assails us, Grant us your peace, Lord. It is here where we behold God's will done as he breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, which do not want us to hallow God's name or let his kingdom come. And when he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and faith until we die. This is his good and gracious will. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 